hosts the first community town hall for their county executive and councilman. We we'll believe the schoolhouse is a wonderful setting to bring the community together for these important conversations. So, without further ado, it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you Baltimore County County Executive, Donnie Rossessman. Uh, and I, for one, look very much forward to working with you in the next four years. 
Uh, so uh, both he and I uh, are uh, looking forward to your, your uh, suggestions tonight. Um, and uh, please take a minute to tell us what's on your mind. Again, thank you for coming, District County Executive. Thank you for co-sponsoring this thing. So tonight is a conversation about our priorities. It's why we're co-hosting these town halls throughout all of our council districts. And I want you to know or reaffirm that I ran for county executive because I'm committed to building a better Baltimore County with our council members and with you. And I think that for all of us, that means investing more in the things that matter, investing in our schools, investing in our communities. That's the what. But the how is also important too. And Building that better county means making government more accountable and more transparent, and that's why we are, in fact, doing uh, these, town, these town halls. You might be surprised to learn that uh, over the last two years, does anyone know how many people testify on our county budget? Last two years. Zero was two years ago, and then last year we had both the two people. Um, we had two people last year, and so two people in the last two years. And I don't think that's because clearly people don't care about the issues that confront the county. Uh, but I think it happened because a lot of the opportunities happened so late in the process, uh, or there was insufficient information to really meaningfully engage. I've also heard from citizens that they just told me that they didn't feel like their input mattered. Um, and we're here tonight to try to change that. So tonight is the first of seven, and as we move into the budget cycle, um, we'll be posting more information online about our budget and its process than you've ever seen for Baltimore County before. Uh, one of the things that's been interesting, uh, we've been spending a lot of time digging into what's working and what's not here in Baltimore County, and at my first meeting with the Director of Information Technology, he shared with me the 1851 rule, um, and that was that for many, the attitude was that that's the way we did it in 1851, so why would we do anything a little different? Uh, you know, that was eye-opening in many ways. We spent a lot of time talking about innovating in government, and uh, in some ways we found government's been allergic to the idea. So what we're doing tonight, bringing information, partnering with the council, isn't something that's been done before. Uh, we are trying to change that paradigm of avoiding engagement and move towards actual engagement. I don't know if it was because people feared that if we're honest about the issues we're facing, uh, people think less of us, but I, I come at it from a different perspective. I think the only way we can run the government responsibly is to be honest about what we're facing and listen to you about what those priorities are. Uh, so let's start with the budget and uh, let's, let's talk a little bit about the basics. So this current fiscal year, uh, we're expected to take in $3.6 billion, and the bulk of that comes from three primary pots. Um, that's the property tax, the income tax, and the state aid. We also bring in money from things like permit fees and restaurant inspections. Um, we receive federal aid from things like transportation and education, and we have some service taxes on hotel, motel, and public service utility. So this is really the, the picture where the money comes, and then there's the question of where does it go? And unsurprisingly, our biggest investment in Baltimore County is on the school system. Uh, you can see that nearly half of our operating budget, uh, almost $1.8 billion, goes to the K-12 system. And it's obvious why we make that investment. Education is the best tool for opportunity and economic mobility. Our next biggest investments are public works and public safety. There's an 8% non-departmental slice that uh, our budget guys use to categorize things like healthcare and pensions, um, and that's all on the operating side. So then we turn to, to capital. How do we do the bridges and the roads and the schools that we talk about? And the two biggest sources for our funds there are general obligation bonds and metro district, district bonds. Um, the, the GO or general obligation bonds are the things that you see every general election you vote for. Um, bond questions, um, and then the metro funds are bonds that are repaid by the revenue from water and sewer fees. So on the capital side where the money goes um, is largely, we spent a large amount of money on those capital dollars on upgrading our ancient water and sewer infrastructure, and as you can see, the next biggest investment um, on our capital side goes to our schools. 
So that pie chart's about providing a good snapshot of where we are in the current budget, uh, but I think it only tells part of the story. Uh, so we're gonna spend just a few minutes walking through some of the challenges we face um, in future budgets as we sort of move ahead. Um, as the council had mentioned, we've actually spent a lot of money on the Schools for Our Future program, uh, driving a lot of progress in eliminating overcrowding in our elementary schools, modernizing schools in need, and centralizing, putting central air in uh, across our county. Countywide, we've air conditioned 59 schools, uh, built 16 new ones, and put additions in 12. Closer to home here in the fifth, um, there were 10 schools that had been air conditioned at the elementary level. Stoneley was renovated and had the addition. Um, Dumbarton had a renovation, and then there is also um, the new Honeygo Elementary School. In addition to that, there's still a planned middle school as part of the Schools for the Future at the Nottingham site. Uh, and it's important to remember in the context of all that that this plan is still underway. Uh, the work isn't done on that Schools for the Future. Uh, while 75 projects have been completed, there are four that are currently in process and 10 that have yet to be started. Uh, and the estimates for completing the Schools for Our Future program uh, is more than $600 million or more. So bear in mind that the state gives Baltimore County um, on, on average between 40 and $45 million annually towards these capital construction needs. Um, our best year in the last five years was $49.9 million. And in order to stay on the accelerated schedule that was presented when the Schools for Our Future program was initially um, established um, and have that program be complete in fiscal year 2021, which is next year's budget. Uh, we really have to have um, some acceleration from the state uh, of Maryland to make that happen. Uh, the state has to accelerate their contribution towards our projects because if they don't do so, um, it will require the county to push those projects, the existing projects out until fiscal 2024. So the good news there is that Governor Hogan has proposed significant new investments for school construction, uh, which means Baltimore County can get more, uh, potentially a whole lot more, if the legislature passes that bill or identifies some other mechanism to accelerate capital contributions to Baltimore County. Uh, so I support the proposal and look forward to working with the uh, legislature and our delegation to build some bipartisan support at schools. Um, Another issue that we're going to be facing in the years ahead is uh, retiring health care. Um, folks who work for Baltimore County for a long time uh, receive life and health insurance um, after they retire, and we have an obligation here in Baltimore County to ensure that these uh, OPED benefits, which provides the health and uh, life insurance, uh, remain solid. But for the past uh, few years, we haven't funded it the way that we should. And as a result, the way things stand right now, the fund has about $385 million in assets, which sounds like a lot, until you realize that we have $1.9 billion in liabilities. So we're funded at about 19%, and we need to try to get to at least 50%. Uh, and we have to pick up those payments, again, if we're gonna honor those commitments to public servants who put their time in working for Baltimore County. Additionally, uh, we're facing some environmental obligations. So in 2005, we entered a consent decree with the federal government on our sanitary sewer system practices. Um, we were accused of uh, being in violation of the Clean Water Act and putting it sort of politely. Uh, we're dumping raw sewage into the streams, creeks, and rivers that run into the bay. So as a result, we entered into a consent decree that requires us to eliminate those overflows. Uh, last year, we borrowed $268 million to invest in our wastewater treatment, uh, but where it's estimated that we have to spend an additional $696 million in 2019 through 2023 uh, to meet that obligation of the agreement. At the same time, uh, under federal law, we're required to reduce runoff um, into the Chesapeake Bay, and so the remediation practices necessary to comply with that law and to have the permits associated with it also costs money. Uh, so some of you may remember the rain tax. Uh, that was originally how the county intended to pay for those investments. Uh, but that remediation fee was repealed in 2017. And so that $24 million a year to pay for the investments um, is actually coming out of our, um, our metropolitan fund to pay for the water and sewer upgrades. So we are paying for it there. Uh, but that does also mean that the 
that's $24 million that we're not spending on those uh, enhancements. In addition to those uh, needs, I want to talk a little bit about our personnel and our workforce. Um, so over the past three decades, Baltimore County has done a lot to constrain the growth of general government um, in order to prioritize schools and public safety. So actually, Baltimore County has cut its workforce by 24% over the last three decades while growing our public school workforce by 50% and our safety workforce by 16%. Um, and all the while, um, the county's population grew by 20% uh, to about 832,000 people. So where do these cost drivers lead us? Um, our current budget is balanced. Um, we're in the 20. 19, where that red and green line match up perfectly, um, but that isn't going to last very long. Uh, the budget we're working on now already for next year is already out of balance, and even if we just meet the legal and contractual obligations, we have about an $81 million gap between anticipated revenues and required expenditures. So how do we address that? The only way to close those two lines significantly um, is to take a significant bite out of our fund balance, which is that, that sort of gray line. Um, and if you think about your, your family budget, that's sort of like dipping into your savings account and your 401k to pay for everyday expenses. Um, not to mention that the recommendation, and frankly the law, that the council passed requires us to have a 10% fund balance, which is that dotted blue line. Um, if you ever had to dip into your savings and your 401k, um, you know that's not sustainable. And so I just wanted to paint the picture that if we continue the path that we're on, uh, the county will soon drain down its fund balance and not have a sustainable path towards our budget challenges. Um, so as a result of some of these trends, um, the county was actually warned last year that we we're at risk of losing our coveted AAA bond rating. Uh, rating down ratings that it's more expensive to borrow money from the things that we want to invest in like our, our school buildings. So, and I want to just pause here for a second because I want to make a point that these forecasts are based on what's currently budgeted and obligated. Um, these do not account for things like new high schools, teacher pay raises, expansion of pre-K. They also do not account for the increased resources, which I think we all want to find a way to make happen um, for the school system next year to do things like hire more teachers, school counselors, social workers, and psychologists, among other things. So, those are some of the very serious fiscal challenges we're facing, but of course, there are other things that we've talked about, and we've heard from you, and that I hope to hear even more from about where we need to go in the years ahead to build a better county. Um, so, the, the next round of investment on school facilities will be focused on those high schools. Uh, we know that we're facing a capacity crisis, and that there are going to be uh, 1,700 more students than there are seats. Um, we, so we also know that several of our high schools need to be replaced, and others require significant modernization. Um, so there were three scenarios. Uh, the school board contracted with Sage Policy in 20 for our study, and uh, their recommendations require seven to 10 capital projects in the ballpark of $600 million or, or more. Uh, schools aren't our only capital need, um, so in the next three years, we anticipate spending uh, $43 million to resurface aging roads, $30 million to upgrade our 911 system, and uh, $32 million to finish the health center for professionals on the SS campus of our community college. Uh, and finally, $78 million for a police fire facility and other infrastructure to support the Trade Point Atlantic project. Now, these investments aren't frivolous. I think they go a long way to ensure a high quality of life. And frankly, in some cases, like road resurfacing, the experts actually suggest we should be trying to find ways to spend uh, even more. So we also need uh, clean, safe, modern facilities, but um, we know that we're being told through um, issues like Kerma, the Kerma Commission, which is studying uh, education, that we need to find ways to have a modern system focused on preparing our kids. Uh, and to do that, we require having a great teacher in every classroom. Um, and I think that means we have to be competitive with our neighbors. Uh, so on average, the average teacher salary um, in Baltimore County is a little shy of $66,000 a year. Um, for context, that's less than Baltimore City, it's less than Montgomery, 
Howard, Prince George's, Frederick, Cecil, Calder, uh, and it's less than the state average. And I would just note that if you look at Montgomery and Howard, they are two of the highest performing uh, school systems uh, in, in the state um, that sort of anchor the success of our state. In addition to our teachers, we need to do more to invest that we're, make sure we're doing more for our students by investing in um, early uh, education. That means investing in universal countywide pre-K. Uh, and that's another finding of the Kerlin Commission that came out. Uh, research has found that children who attend preschool have higher earnings, commit fewer crimes, are more likely to keep and hold a job, and are more likely to graduate from high school as opposed to those who don't. Um, also, as families sort of struggle with the cost of quality childhood care, um, it's another thing we can do for our working families. Uh, we also want to build on some of the work that's been done in accessing higher ed and job training. We know that nearly 90% of graduates from CCBC stay and earn $10,000 a year more than just a high school diploma. Uh, previous administration and council launched a community college uh, promise program. The state's launching one too. Um, I think these are good starts, but we know that they exclude things like the cost of certificate programs or workforce restart trainings. Um, they're limited to, to just recent high school graduates, so it's one of the things we're looking to do, to do more. Um, outside of education and infrastructure, um, other investments that we want to make to make Baltimore County more modern and innovative um, is focused on everything from opioids, where we have, have to act decisively. Um, in the first six months of 2018, there were 215 overdose deaths in the county. We have the second highest rate of overdose deaths in the entire state. Um, so finding ways to prevent those deaths means expanding access to treatment and uh, doing more to support our health um, community. On sustainability, uh, I, we believe we have an imperative to do more for our environment. We have 232 miles of shoreline. We know that climate change presents real and significant threats to our coastal areas. Um, so we have to find ways to make investments to have a sustainable future for those community assets on the water. But we also know that with record rainfall, we've seen communities across Baltimore County, including in District 5, with significant flooding. So having investments to, in our communities on these challenges are very important. Uh, on housing, we have a, a legal obligation with the federal government to build more affordable housing. Uh, we're ahead of schedule on that front, but there was a $30 million housing fund that was created that has already been largely expended. So we haven't met all of our obligations there. That fund was largely expended before coming into office. Uh, things like recreation parks, people deserve vibrant communities, uh, people deserve bike lanes, they deserve walkability, um, all things that have to be holistic and comprehensive as we sort of move forward. So we've presented a, a pretty stark picture of where we are, where we still yet need to go. Um, so in order to get there, uh, we've tried to take some action immediately start addressing those challenges. Uh, I believe that most organizations benefit from an outside set of eyes, and I think government's no different. So uh, the first official action I took, uh, the day I was actually sworn in, was to create a commission, a Blue Ribbon Commission on Fiscal Sustainability. Their, their task of taking a top to bottom look at all of our practices to find ways that Baltimore County can be more streamlined, uh, that we can be more transparent in our numbers, uh, and more honest with you. It's a seven-member panel. The council honored at three. We put up four. It includes experts, experts with extensive public and private sector uh, experience. Now they're going to give us a, a full account of what's ahead. Uh, my guess is they will give us as much bad news as good news. Uh, but I think it's important to get everything on the table so that um, the, the public, the county council, and our administration has a better picture of where to go. Uh, now Baltimore County also does an annual fiscal audit, but I want to go further than that. Um, so in, I will be issuing uh, an RFI for a county-wide performance audit to determine ways of additional efficiencies and savings. Uh, we're also going to establish an Office of Inspector General. Uh, council, we can look forward to that legislation soon, I'm sure, um, to ensure that there's no uh, waste, fraud, or abuse in government. Um, other juris jurisdictions have an Inspector General to investigate such complaints, and it's time for us to have one. Too. Uh, I've heard some stories from employees about being afraid to report things for fear of retaliation, and so we're going to make sure we empower and establish an independent agency to take these reports seriously.
seriously. We're also going to move towards a performance management system. Um, so when Baltimore City launched CityStat nearly 20 years ago, uh, they were ahead of the curve. Two decades later, uh, we still don't have one here in Baltimore County, which puts us way behind the curve. Uh, so we're going to use our data to communicate with you about our performance and to hold our agencies accountable in delivering results. Uh, and additionally, we're going to make sure that we leave no money on the table. Um, we can do a better job um, and leave less money on the table when we aggressively pursue grants um, from the state and federal partners, as well as the private sector, both nonprofits and for-profit businesses. And I've already directed my department heads to start pursuing those opportunities as we try to increase capacity. Finally, um, I had a conversation with our department heads where we instructed them to develop budgets for the upcoming fiscal year that assumes no new revenue. Uh, I told them to identify programs that might have outlived their purpose, to collaborate across programs to find and eliminate redundant practices, because we're going to have to look at every nickel we spent in Baltimore County to determine if we need to be spending it, and as hard as it will be to find some programs that aren't core to our mission or achieving our purposes. Uh, on April 15th, I'll announce and uh, introduce my first budget to the County Council. Uh, they have until May 31st to review and approve it. Uh, but this is where the fun part is, you have a role to play. Uh, so please continue to send ideas to us at ideas at baltimorecountymd.gov. Uh, please remember that what we do isn't in a vacuum and that we do have to start a legislative session that's underway. And having partners at the state is really critical to the success of Baltimore County. So our delegation in Annapolis are our partners. They'll be fighting for us, and please let them know that you're, you're with them and pushing alongside them. So I said at the start, this was meant to be a conversation about what kind of county we are and what kind of county we want to be. Um, I think that we can be both fiscally responsible and forward thinking, but that starts with honest conversations about what our priorities are and where we want to go. Um, so that's where we turn this over to you because we want to hear your thoughts about what your priorities are for you and your family. So, if you're interested in sharing a comment uh, with myself and the councilman, if you want to start lining up in the, uh, the, the walkways there, uh, and assuming there are some folks who want to talk, uh, we can try to make sure that we have enough time for everyone to speak to uh, keep our, our remarks to a few minutes. Uh, if there's more time, we can sort of circle back around. We want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity. Uh, if there are needs for follow-up, one of our community liaisons to make sure we get that as well. So we'll just we'll bounce back and forth. So thank you. And thank you again. Good evening. County Executive, Councilman, elected officials, and my fellow citizens. My name is Elizabeth Eck. I represent Berkeley Square Community Association. Berkeley Square is a small, mostly row house community of about 100 homes two blocks east of Towson University. The major issues we face in Berkeley Square are as a result of Towson University's steady growth and spillover into surrounding neighborhoods, including ours. TU's goal to expand to a 25,000 enrollment without adequate on-campus housing has had a tsunami effect in our community. As older owners aged out, Homes have been bought up by investors who rent to students. Most of those investors do not abide the law that no more than two unrelated people can live in those homes. We see four and five people crammed into these houses, and the result is a crush of too many cars, too much trash, regular noisy parties. Berkeley Square has traditionally been an affordable family neighborhood. Now, it's turning into a student ghetto. Our community has taken landlords to court for rooming house, boarding house violations and trash violations for decades. We have invested weeks, even months, in filing and following cases and then testifying at hearings. But the administrative law judge steered violators to compliance versus enforcement so that in rare cases, violators pay fines. County courts need to enforce the financial penalties for violations, especially from repeat offenders. 
The county needs to institute a law that if there are multiple violations against a property, be it for rooming house boarding <coughs> violations, trash, social host ordinance violations, that landlords' rental registration should be terminated, period. The burden of proof regarding these violations falls to the residents. Adequate resources should be allocated to the county to assume this role. We have lost many Berkeley Square neighbors who no longer wanted to put up with the erosion of our community. Towson belongs to all of us, not just Towson University. We stridently appeal to you to fix this broken system. Thank you. Once again, on the back burner. 
As president of Crumb Valley Park, I've continued to reach out to donors to help move this project forward without the funding for the pavilion for the larger project. In addition to a $4,000 4, memorial and year-end donation, I researched, received word yesterday that the Halton Garden Club will be donating $10,500 to this project. We are still in need of the original funds ordered by Judge Stahl to realize our vision of access to our educational barnatorium for those in wheelchairs, permeable surface to our Willow Grove Nature Center, Nature Discovery Zone, and Children's Garden. We firmly believe that if you build it, they will come. With only five accessible parks in Baltimore County, we feel that adding this feature to our park will enable, enable our children, senior citizens, adults with mobility challenges, uh, to experience being ensconced in, na in nature and participate in our nature education programs. I thank you for making this long-going issue a priority for your administration and to help make Cromwell Valley Park a place in which all community, community members may enjoy. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. And if I could just ask to make sure that someone on our team can make sure that we're getting, if there are copies of what copies. you're sharing and we have the contact information because what we don't want is for anyone to not have a return email or phone call. Uh, that, that is important. So we can make sure that the team that you're out there can make sure you're getting that information. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Good evening. Thank you for your time and opportunity to share concerns regarding the needs of this district. My name is Colin Baldwin. I'm the Vice President of the Pleasant Plains Elementary PTA, the parent of a second grader and future panther, as well as the proud spouse of a middle school art teacher in this district. As you've already mentioned, overcrowding and school capacity remain significant concerns among many schools, including those in the fifth district. I'd like this opportunity to draw that attention to such concerns at our school in an effort to accelerate both short and long-term solutions to address our needs. Pleasant Plains is located in Mott Raven Village right down the road and serves several communities between Towson and Parkville. Our state-rated capacity is 509 students, yet as of today, our enrollment sits at just over 700, which equates to 138% of that state-rated capacity. Historical and future projections from the school system have predicted declining enrollment. However, actual school enrollment data show quite the opposite. The level of overcrowding creates potential safety concerns during arrival and dismissal, in navigating the hallways and relocatables, and in providing adequate restroom or cafeteria capacity. By way of example, our lunch schedule begins at 10.30, meaning some of our students are having lunch only two hours after being provided breakfast at school. Based on a 2014 facilities assessment, our building's core space is undersized for its state-rated capacity. Furthermore, a 2008 school system report to assess elementary school overcrowding in Towson indicates that while there are some challenges, our building and property are largely favorable for renovation and expansion. While we've been convinced in previous capacity and boundary discussions, we've genuinely felt little impact from some of the recent area changes, such as the building of West Towson or the expansion of Hampton. We are keenly aware that the needs of Pleasant Plains are not unlike those in other county schools. In fact, many of our neighboring schools are experiencing or are on the verge of similar overcrowding issues, suggesting that redistricting alone would not comprehensively address the issue. We strongly believe that Pleasant Plains must be among those schools considered in the near-term capital improvements to sustain our students and staff, thus benefiting the community at large. We have begun to address our concerns with the school board, as well as our community superintendent, who we have the opportunity to meet with this evening. We just respectfully ask that county leadership also continue to play an active role in developing meaningful solutions with all relevant stakeholders, and welcome the opportunity to discuss this further in the near future. Thank you so much for consideration. Thank you very much. School overcrowding is caused in some places by development and in other places by demographic changes. The development part is why in the Perry Hall area we downzone land. But in your area, you have younger families moving in. It started in the 2000s in Towson, it's moving east toward you know, Parkville and Perry Hall. It's a, it's a good thing to have. You want to have newer families coming in, but it does create those challenges. And thank you for bringing those to our attention. I'm Dr. Carol Newell of Elk 
open space, green infrastructure, and parks. Um, I'm talking in support of right about parks phase two for the Green Towson Alliance and the surrounding communities that consider Towson near downtown. Do people remember the old, outdated greenhouses by Maryland Avenue? They were near the Radebaugh Warehouse in Towson. The county bought those 2.4 acres using state Maryland Program Open Space Funds, a state bond fund, and some county money. The greenhouses are gone, and the land is being sculpted for a grassy open park. That park will serve the thousands who live, work, and go to school nearby. What we need now is funds for phase two to add important features to the park. Imagine riding your bike to the park and walking it to the, a new bike rack. Imagine walking across the park on a path, sitting on a bench, to watch children enjoy a new play set under the cool shade of native trees. Imagine using a trash can or reading a wooden sign that says, Radevon Neighborhood Park, open sunrise to sunset. Please budget money for these park amenities that the community has said they strongly desire. Thank you. congestion and the resulting poor air quality. Please fund plant public transit such as the circulator. Funding for complete streets and greenways such as the Six Bridges Trail can connect open spaces for wildlife and recreation while further alleviating traffic problems. Two, using natural systems like fire retention basins, rain gardens, and permeable pavement to manage stormwater has many benefits. Please provide money for these kinds of green infrastructure improvements alongside any public works project in downtown Towson or throughout the whole county uh, to help alleviate downhill flooding, improve water quality, create habitat, and beautify our urban spaces. Three, development in our county needs to be clean. We ask that incentives be provided for redevelopment projects that meet the silver standards or above. We ask that environmental and open space provisions of the downtown Towson District zoning overlay be strengthened and for the overlay to be amended to fully implement the Washington Towson plan that so many people participated in a form like this many years ago. It's never been fully realized. Thank you very much. Among the many things that the councilman and I agree on is expanding uh, the transit options both said, I think, in several forums that uh, Towson would be a great place to start a circulator project that helps address some of those concerns. So we're forward to working on things. Councilman, county uh, exec. Uh, my name is Lou Heron. I'm a former county school bus driver. And, and um, we have problems with people running buses all the time. And Montgomery County has cameras on their buses to at least slow them down. They have at least 80 to 85 percent success rate of slowing them down. We'd like to see those cameras on our Baltimore County buses so we could, you know, keep these kids safe because everybody says that safety starts in school. I believe it starts picking up and dropping off the students. Thank you. Presenting three individuals, my, me, myself, and I. <laughs> Not necessarily in that order. It's a good time for one person. <laughs> All of us are familiar with the phrase "attitude is everything." The older we get, the more we understand how meaningful and significant the phrase is. When I travel about within my small world within Baltimore County, I am constantly reminded of the phrase because I notice the truth trees on county-owned property. In addition to the shameful state of too many of the 30 to 40-year-old willow oak trees 
along Bonsley Avenue bypass and Towson. I see other trees also destined to a premature death because I see wrong trees planted in wrong places or trees planted at the wrong elevation within the hole dug for them or trees planted along the street with inadequate space for the tree's trunk and root system. I also see trees suffering with root girdling or umbrella effect drought stress or rodent damage or fungal disease, all of which are either a direct result or an indirect result of mulch volcano. Every single one of those issues I just mentioned are man-made, brought about by either poor training or poor attitude. I prefer to believe, and I do believe, it is more the former than the latter. However, the better training must begin with a better attitude, or the training will be inadequate or not followed. When a taxpayer asks the appropriate county employees to address the result of those issues, the answer is always, no funds have been allocated by the county. However, almost all of those funds would be unnecessary if correct steps were taken initially. Although funds are needed to address the mistakes made, this is clearly a case where an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The fix is easy. A better attitude followed by better training. Thank you. This is a wonderful branch. It's a great location. They have a very impressive collection there and they have wonderful programs. But people who are pedestrians, people who are coming off the bus have a very hard time getting in the door. And um, so this is a, a fiscal uh, a facilities issue that we need some help with. And, and this is a reminder because I remember that last year, Helen, uh, took you on a little tour of what a person goes through if they actually have to walk into the library. Now, it's one thing if you drive into the parking garage. It's a little bit of a learning curve to figure out what level you should park on and how to get into the library there. That's how most people get in. But for those who need the library most, those who are walking there, those who are taking a bus, 
they have to find from that corner of Chesapeake and York, they have to find their way down a, a very sloping ramp to get in those doors. And then they have to climb this ramp that spirals up to the third floor, which is a real treat. If you have a baby stroller and you have a little toddler hanging on to you, and God forbid you should have walked in there with a cane or a walker or a wheelchair, on that lower level, you have to, after you've risked your life going down that ramp, you have to uh, figure out how to get a hold of the library staff for them to come down a service elevator and get you. So it would be really lovely if you could provide a working public elevator for people to actually use all the money that we've already put into that library. And the Towson Friends have a wonderful fundraising book sale that they do every spring, but it doesn't bring in that kind of money. It brings in money to get new toys for the children's area, to do the gardening, that sort of thing. But this is a building that's owned by the county, and I really feel that the county ought to pay for an elevator that serves people. So thank you for considering that. Hi, hello, my name is Cheryl Gottlieb and I live in downtown Towson. And really quickly, I wanted to mention um, my previous career was in public mental health. And there's statistics that say that if somebody's brought into an ER after an overdose, and they meet with somebody who's already been in recovery for several years, they're 60 times more likely to go and treat them themselves. The state, uh, the Behavioral Health Administration, is putting a lot of money into peer to peer services, and maybe we need more money from the state than other counties. So that's an avenue to go for that. Um, but the reason why I'm here right now is because I chose to live in downtown Towson because of the proximity to public transit because I'm somebody who's not able to drive. And I chose it because of the proximity. I sometimes use a wheelchair um, because mobility paratransit is not the most reliable. That there's a lot of places that I can get independently with my wheelchair without even having to deal with the bus or mobility. The problem that happens is when we have a significant snowfall. And my understanding is that people are supposed to be getting fined for not shoveling their sidewalks. And that is not happening. One of the worst offenders around me is Tadco Towers, where a lot of disabled people live. And in the 10 years I've lived in my apartment building, I, have, I don't live there, I live in another building. I have never ever seen the property owners of that building shovel the sidewalk in front of their building. Another issue is that when people do shovel, they, they shovel the sidewalk and leave the snow in the curb cut. So I get to the end of the block, I have to turn around to get off the sidewalk, and sometimes half of my trip between my apartment and where I'm going, I'm rolling in the street. Where cars might not see me and I can get hit. Um, so my suggestion is, I also went to a community safety meeting about a year and a half ago, and I was told that some properties, because of when they were built, the county owns the sidewalk in front of the property. Other properties, the property owner owns the sidewalk and is responsible for shoveling. And that the county has no records and has no idea which sidewalk they're responsible for shoveling versus property owners are responsible for shoveling. And I think that if we created, we first figured that out and then created a mechanism for community members to take photographs of people that are in violation of not shoveling, could submit them to the county and could get some sort of enforcement mechanism for the county to come out and find people for not shoveling. More people would gain compliance, number one, and number two, a decent fine would increase revenue for the county. <laughs> Don't, if you've got a smartphone, um, if you haven't already downloaded, there's a, it's called Baltimore County Go app, uh, Baltco Go. And actually one of the things you can do is if there's a code enforcement complaint or concern in your community, um, you actually can take a picture of it and submit it um, through your app and, and get updates from, from Baltimore County relative. So we actually have that one covered.
But I love the recommendation about the, uh, the treatment. So thank you again. Yeah. All right, Dr. Paul, she had it right on. <laughs> I'm Brenda Bodian, and I'm here on my own behalf, but also a member of the Save Towson Skateway. And I know that um, you were at the April 18th last year tree gate gathering at the corner of Bosley and York um, to try to find some answers as to what remediation would occur for 30 trees, major trees that were taken down, mature trees that were taken down from that property. And we've made a lot of progress. The developers have come up with a plan that's more suitable and are working through the process. But we're getting conflicting answers from different people as to who's responsible for replacing the trees. And I know Councilman Marks and went and made an effort to try to find some way to get the county to replace those trees. And it's, we're not talking a lot about a lot of money. It would also help you could, if there's not room in the downtown Towson district, there is room to do some kind of fee in lieu, and that could be utilized to plant trees to prevent flooding in any other part of, of our county or the district. Because we'd like it to be in our district. We prefer it to be in downtown Towson. But if you could look into that, and I have a little more uh, lengthy description and a copy for Councilman Marks so that you can pow out and get back to me on that. Thank you.
such as has been done for years by virtually every other urbanized political jurisdiction in America, except Baltimore capital. This is not just an issue of raising revenue, which obviously we need, but also of equity and fairness to the county's taxpayers. Uh, I'll also commit at this point to supporting revenue enhancement. Uh, measures that may be proposed, it's painfully obvious to me that uh, that's, where, that's where we're going to have to go. Uh, also, the people, things people are complaining about, about lack of services, is a reflection of the 25% reduction in line agency <coughs> staffing that can't be done uh, without additional resources. Regarding the county street treatment of street trees, the county is spending billions to cut down trees that need not be removed. I heard a number of I can't corroborate it, $15 million a year. There are alternatives to cutting many of these trees down. This money could be better spent on saving our valuable neighborhood street trees, tree canopy. The entire culture, policy, and management of urban street trees needs to be brought into compliance with modern practices. And rec and parks or DEPRM should be made the lead agency for tree programs. Thank you.
couple here who have run into capricious and arbitrary behavior by zoning officials and non enforcement. We have people who will testify that they were told by the county, by the county official picking up the phone, that they were told by Arnold not to respond. Okay? What the, why I'm going to warn you is that Drew Carroll, who as you know, was a prosecutor. Uh, we, are, we are going to be putting together a complaint to the state based on denial of our right to due process. And if we get frosty enough, we'll sue the county. Okay? So that is just to put you on to alert. Now, if you can't hear, we are having a meeting next Tuesday. If you would like, if you or one of your staff would like to attend. We'll make sure we have someone there. Okay, who should I give this to? So you can get the whole, the rest of the story. And I want you to know that the moving forward um, in that department or any department, well, you, if you, you do not, not you will always, away. you will always get a response. And if, if anyone in this audience ever does not get a response, I want to know about it. Okay. You will see the man. I don't want you to get frosty. So. <laughs> <laughs> you will see the man in the right. Uh, before the next speaker, I, I think I may be elected. I didn't, didn't have her on my um, sheet, but I also recognize one of our leaders um, in the General Assembly, uh, Delegate Kathy Schlegel, as well. So. Good evening. Uh, my name is Sunday Umo. Uh, as a fish discussed working with uh, Baltimore City in regards to crime, I want to quickly talk about the conversation regarding White Marsh Mall. I urge all Baltimore County officials that you do not punish the many because of the few. A 5 p.m. curfew for teenagers becomes discriminatory and will only affect a certain group of people. As a resident, I will find that completely disturbing. Thankfully, talks of limiting or eliminating bus routes at a certain time are over, I hope, as that was leading towards segregation. These past months have been going down a dark road that I want us to steer uh, clear from. In an area where crime has statistically gone down, I suggest officials get with White Marsh Mall to mimic what's going on in uh, the avenue across the street, uh, which is by adding like, a police presence to deter bad behavior, bad behavior from teenagers and adults. Again, let us not punish the many teenagers because of what the few teens and adults has caused these past months in an already decreasing crime area. Thank you. existing needs and provide no room for future growth. 
In addition, the state, existing state park equipment is grossly outdated and does not provide skateboarders with a high quality recreational experience. To meet the current and future needs of Baltimore County skateboarders, we want to create a network of regional and community skate parks that will serve the county skateboarders and their families for decades to come. But modern concrete skate parks are expensive. And while our council is actively working to gain funding support through private and public grants, business sponsorships, and grassroots fundraising, we can't do it alone. We are asking your administration to provide dedicated skate park funding in the next budget to help us create a new regional skate park, which we hope to have completed in late 2020. We're just in time to be limited. In addition, we may be missing out on a tremendous funding opportunity due to the fact that, historically, Baltimore County has not provided matching funds for state grants. In light of former County Executive Mueller's recent decision to set aside $200,000 in annual matching funds for footpaths and trails, the Baltimore County State Board Council asked that your administration consider expanding this very important source of funding for other recreational projects like regional community skate parks, which provide unique recreational opportunities on behalf of the entire Baltimore skateboarding community, I thank you for your time. Good evening. <clears throat> thank you for being here and for the opportunity to share concerns about the needs of this district. My name is Colleen Carr, and I'm the parent of a first grader at Pleasant Plains Elementary School, as well as two other Baltimore members. As you mentioned, overcrowding and school capacity are significant concerns among many schools. I'm here to draw attention to the overcrowding concerns at Pleasant Plains and to ask for the county to partner with PCPS to develop both short and long-term solutions that will address our needs. As you heard, our state-rated capacity is 509 students and our current enrollment sits at just over 700, which again is 138% of that state-rated capacity. Enrollment projections from PCPS continue to predict declining enrollment, but our actual enrollment data shows that's just not the case. This level of overcrowding creates potential safety concerns during arrival and dismissal for students navigating the hallways and relocatable classrooms, of which we have five, and provide adequate restroom and cafeteria space. As an example, my first grader eats lunch at 1045, just a couple of hours after he gets to school. When I pick him up at 320, he's starving. A 2014 facilities assessment shows our building's core space is undersized for the state-rated capacity. You heard that a 2008 school system report to assess elementary school overcrowding shows that our building and property are largely favorable for expansion. Our last expansion, by the way, was in the 70s. So my question is, what do you see as your role in partnering with BCPS on this issue? And I'd like to again thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Um, just to make sure you get it. Our, our role is to make sure that we partner with the board. Um, one of the things that we've talked about is actually having a long-term plan we are not doing these things ad hoc any longer, um, so that we are comprehensive and thorough in addressing all those needs. Um, I recognize we can't do it all overnight, but at the same time, there's an urgency of getting it done because every year, every day that we don't do something, your children and the children of Baltimore County aren't being served the way that they should be. So um, I appreciate you sharing along with everybody else.
but to keep that that old building intact because it's such an integral part of, of Baltimore County and has been since the 1940s. Um, my second point would be uh, <clears throat> I'm also the president of the Friends of the Lock Raven Library branch. And <clears throat> as you may know, Lock Raven Library branch is the little, little library in the woods on Taylor Avenue just off of Lock Raven. And uh, there are people who drive by it because it's in the woods and don't know it's there. But it's a great library, great walkable library for so many neighborhoods in that area that uh, we would like to see some needed improvements to the Lock Raven branch. Uh, most specifically an elevator for access, some added parking perhaps in the back, and uh, the fact that people, people all over use it. The, the meeting room is in constant use practically by various organizations, including the Friends. But um, if the building is half used, half shared by the health department, and if we could arrange it, would love to see the librarians I know would like to see more library space used in that building for the library. So if that can be taken into consideration, we surely appreciate it. Um, third thing I would mention next to our points as a library builder, I'm on Doxbury Road, which is one block off of Joppa. And uh, we have a situation now where in Joppa Road corridor, is growing rapidly. Lots more businesses through there. Old Lock Raven Boulevard and beyond. Traffic has increased greatly. And our street, as well as Dell's Way, is being used as a um, pass by route in case of blockage or accidents on Lock Raven, in addition to the added uh, traffic. We would certainly love to see, and this is long overdue, uh, since the east part of Lock Raven Village has been repaved some years ago. West Lock Raven Village in our neighborhood has not. We would love to see repaving. If you get a portion of money for that and for speed bumps on Bells Way, uh, Knoxbury, and Romwood, it would greatly improve things. And believe me, it's a safety issue because people <coughs> come down Knoxbury at maybe sometimes 45, 50 miles an hour. And the other day I, st I stood in the street with my dog between two cars and Fortunately, did not step out because the car came within probably 18 inches of us as it sped by, not even seeing us. So, please take that into account. My fourth point, um, to echo what the first speaker said over here some a while back, uh, there are many code violators in our community who have developed apartments within these row homes, and they have too many renters in there. Nothing against renters or they're good people, but you get the, the absentee owner having different renters who are not related to the same building. This is a code violation. And I and several members of Lock Raven Village have been to the code hearings, and we know that the code enforcement is extremely lax. We found out that people are giving, uh, being given half the uh, fines required or mandated, and they're giving extra time to to uh, remedy their situation. So please, make code enforcement viable and more uh, productive as far as the Treasury goes by letting them correct lines and giving people only the given amount of time to remedy their situation. Thank you. Good evening, gentlemen. I think this is a, a wonderful thing that you've started and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you, to you tonight. Uh, my name is John Sevega. I am the president of Baltimore County Firefighters, representing 1,100 career professional paramedic and firefighters. And I'm here today to basically support the county executive and the openness that we have seen so far in this administration. Uh, representing 1,100 uh, men and women and doing the job every single day. 
County Executive has spoke to the opioid crisis. We are on the front lines of that every single day. We are seeing it daily. And we're seeing the effects of the family members in a day-to-day -day basis. What I'd like to speak to you briefly about is, is the men and women have responded to over 204,000 calls of services in 2018 alone. What the men and women are looking for is, is the upgrades in our facilities. We have beltway facilities that we call, were built in the 60s and the 70s. And some of those facilities are in the same shape that they were in in the 1960s and the 1970s. Single pane, metal frame windows, the same type of tile floors, the same type of equipment that we've been dealing with. We understand that there is budgetary crisis. We understand the budgetary constraints. We understand all of those things. We're just asking that the men and women of the Baltimore County firefighters that are doing the job, that are answering the calls, that are doing the services 24-7, 365 days a year, are treated with respect in regards to the budgetary process. That's all we're looking for tonight. Thank you very much. Have a Thank you. Jim Aber, and I'm a current resident of Towson, and I'm here on behalf of myself, my children, and all other families who have children that are going to be attending Towson High within the next five to ten years. Um, we, we all know that there's been a push over the past few years to address the overcrowding and structure issues of three high schools, um, Towson, Delaney, and Lansdowne, without much success. Um, I think, as Councilman Marks, you had mentioned to me earlier this week, that the stars seem to be in line right now that we can make a major push to address these issues for those three schools. Um, I know this is, the, the, this is a, a, a major concern of your administration and we need to be at the forefront, or your administration, I request that you for, your administration be at the forefront in Annapolis to address these needs, be, be a loud and local voice. Um, and I know you have taken a tour of Towson High, so I won't waste your time with statistics. And Delaney and Lansdowne. Okay. Um, and I know that Towson has a number of challenges that we'll be facing in designing and building a new, new school, um, while at the same time 
addressing the, the historical issue and maintaining the integrity of the structure of the existing building. But my understanding is that there's a study that was done a few years back that um, proposes and shows that a new high school can be built on site adjacent to the existing property with the acquisition of a, proper, a rental property on Hagler. So I, I hope that you would um, take that into consideration, you and the school board and the county council. So, um, and with that, I think that, you know, this could be a historic time for Baltimore County. You know, we have three brand new state-of-the-art 21st century schools by the year 2022, 2023, depending on, you know, what is decided whether it's an accelerated budget or not. So thank you for your consideration. I was going to say, I think it is great that we've got all of the branches of government in different units. So, you know, again, thank you to our school board leadership and our members of the legislature who are here, um, Councilman Marks and his colleagues on the council. I, I think it really is sort of is helpful and instructive in the conversation moving forward. Hi, I'm Mark Baskerville, the Baltimore County Campaign for Liberty. I'm one of those two weirdos who showed up to testify on the budget. Um, <laughs>
We have a vulnerable population. We have direct support staff that are doing things like G tubes and medication administration, seizure administration, or seizure support. And they can go and walk, you know, walk down the street, stock shelves, do you know, online fulfillment of orders for a higher wage. That's just not right. We need to pay for what we value in this county, and I urge you to look at that issue. And I would welcome you to come and visit us meet some of the people that we support, your constituents, we would love to share our stories and really help you to understand this issue and I don't want to tie up tonight, but I would love to have you come and meet with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, County Councilman and uh, Executive and good evening. <coughs> and thank you for inviting us to speak. My name is Jim Leitner. I am the Council Vice President of the Seven Oaks Senior Center in the Perry Hall community. And I'm again bringing up uh, attention to the urgent need to correct parking problems that we're experiencing at the Seven Oaks Senior Center. Our center was built in 1991 with 57 parking spaces and five handicap spaces. The center membership has grown from a few hundred to 800 in 2001 and is now currently 2,000 members. On average, 200 members attend the center facility daily. It is forcing members to park on the street and prompting pedestrian safety issues, which is one of our concerns. Handicap parking is too few, and the distance for some people with those issues is difficult. Unfortunately, Encroachment by school visitors is a part of our problem as we're situated adjacent to the Seven Oaks Elementary School, whose parents often use our parking lot uh, as opposed to the city, uh, the school parking lot. And uh, this also causes some unsafe conditions and issues. Um, so there's limited parking due to these problems and to the school bus traffic, which is a general daily occurrence. Street parking directly in front of our center only holds about 10 car spaces. There's a safety issue when the school buses are traveling up and down the road and seniors are getting out of their cars and acting across the road. Pa uh, a path suggestion for a path, um, we found that a path from street parking to cross over the Seven Oaks uh, facility to avoid the traffic uh, would involve having seniors and seniors with handicaps to have to uh, walk up a rather uh, steep hill uh, to get into the facility. So on behalf of our 2,000 members, we thank you very much for considering our need and uh, for hearing our request. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your liberal post to that senior center. It's a wonderful asset in the community. You're spot on to work on that. And I'll just add, as we're collecting um, individual information to follow up with those issues raised, um, so that we stay in communication over the, the year and, and the term, um, we also are just sort of keeping a, a running list as well, so that we can sort of add all these to the priorities um, as we sort of build out the agenda as well. So we want to make sure we're keeping you updated, but also adding it to the requests of citizens across the county. Thank you very much. Hi guys, thanks for uh, giving us all the opportunity to come and speak tonight. It's a good, good forum. Uh, my name is Joe DeSantis. I'm a member of the uh, Greater Perry Hall community. Um, it's a 55. There's about um, it's about a 55 year old community, um, maybe a little older. All the houses are on about a half acre of land. Um, as of recently, there have been a few septic failures. Um, it, it's a, the community is well in septic, so we've had a few failures. Um, in our, in our community, which has prompted a, um, a sanitary survey to see if public water or sewer were to um, be an option to come into our neighborhood. Um, as we just saw on the, uh, the screen there, this has been the earliest season on record. Um, so, you know, in, in the scope of the budget and uh, doing surveys, doing this survey on the rainiest season in record when rainfall in massive proportions obviously is affecting um, the effluent, um, you know, that there could have been other ways to do, do this. Um, 
the, the, the major issue with this is that as a resident of the community, and there's a lot of different age groups in the community, from younger, newer families to um, elderly folks, um, the cost of the water and sewer, if it is brought into our community, is placed upon all of the residents of the community. There's no way to opt out of it. Um, there's been, there's been, um, you know, comparables done to other neighborhoods in the area, and this can cost upwards of forty to, you know, fifty or more thousand dollars, which is now the burden of members of the community. Um, this is, this is something. So. Um, the problem with it is, is, is not only that, it's a huge financial burden. You know, we've, we've been talking about budgets. You know, for families, budgets is also a, a large concern. Um, there's also interest placed on that. So, you know, it's tacked on at, you know, the end of the end of the year and then 5% interest, which has been in the email. Um, Mr. Morris is well aware of all of this. Um, additionally, uh, what was brought up earlier was the rising cost of uh, sewer and water that is about to be, you know, going into action, um, which is just on top of all of it, you know, having a family to have to put out sixty thousand dollars or more, um, and then the bills that we weren't receiving before. Uh, for we, we take care of our well and septic systems. There's other ways to fix these problems. You know, when you move into the community, you prepare for that. So, based on a few failures, a survey done in the radius here in record. And petitions we've, we've gone around with that sign. Um, there's also discrepancies on said survey, um, which we have petition signing and we have the survey, we have the map, so we can show all of that to you. Um, as for Mr. Marks, uh, in our community there is the Perry Hall Mansion. Uh, it's, a, it's a very old building, historic. Uh, Mr. Marks has stated um, a few years back that he is in favor of making this mansion. Uh, fixing it up right now, it's unusable because of there's no well, or there's, there's well in Sapphic, but it just can't handle a lot of people. So, um, he's been known that, that he, this is the thing that you want, Mr. Marks. So, um, getting this public water and sewer into our neighborhood would obviously fulfill that for you. Now, that's fine, that's great, you know, history is great to preserve, but we have people in our community. We're not willing or able to spend that kind of money in order to, you know, have this happen. Um, when you purchase a home in the neighborhood, you know it's well and septic. You take into account for that. So to have these ongoing bills, it's it's just unacceptable. Um, you know, rain is season on record. We've already discussed that. Um, I don't feel that, nor do a lot of the other people in our community feel that the neglect on other homeowners in the neighborhood should be a burden to everyone else. So I just wanted to make it known that that's a, that's a fairly large sum of money for any family to take on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Perial Mansion is a distinct issue from the public water septic sewerage issue in the rest of the community, I promise you. Uh, we will continue to work with all people in the community. Uh, right now, that survey is at the Department of Public Works. Uh, Executive staff and I have been talking about it. Uh, I promise you that we will consult with all the stakeholders, uh, and it will be a lengthy process. It's not going to be an overnight process. Well, I mean that's just great, but um, with the in regards to the survey, there are obvious discrepancies, um, and it was done in the rainy season record. So that being said, probably not the best uh, you know way to have the survey done or the best time to do it. Thank you. As everyone is aware, there have been several incidents in Perry Hall and White Marsh over the last year or so. My concern is when fear is used to develop policy and when fear is part of the process, of, when fear is part of the policy process, people lose access to opportunities. In the case of trans transportation policy, if we as a community cut off or decrease public transportation, we will lose People will lose their ability to travel back and forth from work, school, recreational activities, and important, important, I'm sorry, and important appointments. We cannot use fear to drive policy or to solve deep rooted issues within our communities. We need positive, constructive ways to expand and ensure accessibility. And I have a few suggestions in this regard. 
First of all, VTech is working towards the establishment of a regional transit authority to create equitable public transit in the region. And we've had several summits and meetings over the past year. And we are also fighting for the adoption of a Title VI equivalent to ensure equal access to public transportation because there is currently not a Title VI equivalent in, the pol in public trans transit policy in the area. Additionally, to ensure everyone has an opportunity to partake in op offerings at White Marsh Mall, we have spoken to White Marsh Mall management and proposed a peer, a peer ambassador's initiative to identify and de-escalate disputes uh, among youth location patrons. I have copies of this proposal right here with me tonight. And then another, another proactive idea that enhances our communities rather than spreading fear is the development of activities for youth. You should be, youth should be involved in the decision-making process. Activities should be open to all youth no matter where they live, and ideally these activities would include a combination of recreational activities and work development programs. We look forward to speaking and working with County Executive Professor Sasaki, sorry for mispronouncing your last name. Johnny was fine. <laughs> and members of the County Council about these initiatives which pr promote equity in the Baltimore region. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maureen Duff. I have two issues to address very briefly. Uh, first, a question, what fees are imposed on developers when they acquire land, and how diligent is the county in collecting those fees? So currently, Baltimore County does not have any impact fees. Impact fees are surcharges placed on builders in most metropolitan counties in the state. Baltimore County cannot levy those until the state legislature gives us the authority to do so. Under home rule, the counties are creations of the states. So, County cannot do that if the state legislature passes that legislation. So is work underway for the state to pass that legislation? It's it was proposed last session. Uh, the session just started. So I would encourage you to contact your state legislators to express your opinion. Okay. Second, um, Councilman Morris, I think you probably are aware of the Oakley Pet Cemetery situation. And I've, since 1994, <coughs> I've had a dog buried there. And I've seen that property deteriorate over many years. Um, two years ago, I worked with Cindy on a route force to <coughs> clean up there. We cleaned up one section, and it, it was for nothing, actually, but it looked good. And recently, I went by again. There is a no trespassing sign here, and I'd like to get permission to go on the property and remove my dog's marker. And I'd also be very happy to work on any task force to try and salvage and save that property. But I would really like to get my dog's marker out of there. Thank you. Well, my family's a cat buried at the Oakley Pet Cemetery. We just don't know where it is anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is, you know, it's home to many animals over the past couple decades. Um, I think a lot of the former uh, owners of the pets have probably passed away. Mm -hmm. Um, I share with you your concerns. It's, it's a frustration for me uh, that it has a property owner who has allowed that land to basically fall into a state of neglect. Um, it's a tough issue. I mean, if you put that property over a tax sale, who buys that? Who would want to buy that? Uh, so it's something we have to work through. It's important for the Ridgely community. Uh, but I will certainly work with you and with uh, the folks in the Ridgely area to see if we can continue to clean up activities. And a lot of scouts have done, a lot of volunteers have done. Thank you. So how would I be able to get my dogs more? We will, we will try to identify what we do know who the property owner is, and we'll you work with me and we'll contact him. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity for this. I really appreciate it. Um, the opportunity to speak to my voice um, from an individual in the county, and I get to speak to the editor, so it's amazing. Um, my name is Shannon McDonald, and I live in the Nolan community of Towson. Um, just like Maryland, so many America, uh, Baltimore County has a beach, it has mountains, and it has a of amenities. And exploring all these parts of Barry County, um, certain themes, themes seem to be repetitive. We have poor crowding, poorly functioning, and mismanaged schools. We have poor buildings with pervious surface with little regard for the stormwater bills of our house management and pain. And then um, lack, of, lack of walkable town centers. Um, Towson, the county seat, offers a multitude of amenities, but 
Road, unlike White Marsh, it doesn't have green space infrastructure linking parks to local neighborhoods and in fact segregates those in Towson from linking to one another and commerce. Um, my request for the county is to spend more money on our schools, redistribute the boundaries if the means are necessary to maintain quality education, afford opportunities for schools to add natural elements to the school property, add some trees, easily add trees and let the kids use the land. This supports the same values as the pre-K program and without screens. Um, record rainfall is an apt term to use. We as a county need to accept that this is the new norm. Design standards need to change the development of land and the maintenance and sustainability of those. Purchase, improve, and maintain green space in the county. Nothing says we need more than trees, but not ones are swallowed up by things of vines. Create parks, bike, and pedestrian connections linking communities and commodities. Support and fund green space like Rad Valley Neighborhood Park, Six Bridge Green Trail, more trees, more green infrastructure that are daylighted, not hidden below. Find a way to make downtown Towson green, not a bright concrete jungle as it stands today. My final request is for the county to refine the requirements for develop developers to contribute to our public infrastructure and keep the money in the district where the work occurs. Plant trees where they were taken away. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Yes, good evening. My name is Mike Pierce. Uh, sorry about the cold. I'm probably just to uh, make some comments on your request to let you know if you don't get a response from some county official. Uh, I wrote to you a couple weeks ago about some issue, and uh, within about an hour, I got a nice professional response from Mike Moore, who I've known for many years. But on another occasion, shortly after we took office, I wrote to you to express my uh, sort of dissatisfaction with a specific, specific county official that I've tried to work with for eight years uh, and never got through to. Um, I got a response, but I got it from that official who quoted my comment to you, and his comment to me was, well, that's not a very good way to uh, get a good working relationship. Of course, I sent the email to Johnny O at Baltimore County. So I guess it's no wonder, if that's the way things are going to work in Towson, I guess it's no wonder that, as you said, a lot of county employees are afraid to raise issues that they see within their own departments. Uh, I, I hope this is going to change, and I believe from what you said that this approach to dealing with things is going to change in your administration. Sure. Let me both be transparent and, and, and authentic. Administrative person who helps me filter those emails. Um, so I do not get to always personally respond to all of them. Um, that message would, should not have been forwarded to an individual. So let me apologize if it happened. Um, but I want you to know that it wasn't something that I, I did, but I own it because I'm a county executive. And so um, I want you to know that that's not the kind of approach we want. Um, we want citizens to be able to come to us with concerns. And uh, you know, I, I appreciate your willingness to, to share um, your frustration about that. That's not uh, the kind of approach that's acceptable to me, and uh, we'll try to make sure it doesn't happen again. But I apologize if you went through it. No, thank you. I, I didn't believe that it was you yourself that did it. I don't. I wouldn't believe it. It was. I wouldn't, wouldn't so begin to believe that you read every one of those emails that someone sends you. Thank you. Thank you. I do actually read a lot of them. I actually do share a lot of them. Uh, I was happy to know that we had a similar uh, background. Uh, I 
I had to go through what I had to go through teaching those children, and that takes a very special person. Um, I'm here on two fronts. The first is the school front to say thank you and to ask for continued advocacy for our entire school building. My daughter is four, so she will be there for a long time. I also have another child in the third grade, so I'll be in that community. I'm a homeowner. I will be spreading around for a very long time, and I'm just grateful and ask for continued support in those areas. We need a new building bad, and I know I was on the committee for the redistricting for the new school. I was the DTA president at the time. I see the process, and I know it's not an easy one. I know it's a long and hard road, but we're here and we're supporting you and all the decisions that you make and grateful that you're supporting us. Well, on top of that, I'm also a Baltimore County employee. I am a crossing guard for Oakley Elementary School, and I love my community. I love both Ridgely and Oakley and how we try our best to come together and make things happen. But safety is a huge area. I'm a safety peace person, so I'm always out there watching our kids and the lack of resources that's available to them. We don't even have garbage cans to throw away trash on the trail up and down for our walkers. There are notoriously empty alcohol bottles in front of people's houses. And I'm not saying people are just throwing them there. Obviously with rain and runoff and sewage and all that stuff. So, you know, but as I walk to work every day, because I'm able to walk, I pick up trash along my way and I have gone to having to bring a bag of my own and having to carry trash that I pick up from work all the way back home just to throw away. And it doesn't make sense. These are little things that even community associations, they're collecting money from me. Not a lot of money, I'm not complaining about it, but you know, we would even buy the garbage cans if we could have some kind of insurance that, you know, it's okay that it be picked up by, by the county or however that works. Um, and also some programs in these schools for these children that are walking home, crossing the street, you know, being out in the public. It's just very, when I was in school, we had, you know, Cruff, Gruff the Crime Dog, and we had all these great programs. And as an educator and a small business owner as well, I work with youth programs, workshops to teach kids these skills. I can't teach them when they're crossing the street, but I love the opportunity to partner with the county to go into these schools as, a, as an employee and also as an independent you know, citizen that wants to tell the young people while they're young enough, because by high school they don't even have crossing guards anymore. We stop pretty much at the middle school and they're probably gonna take that away as you know with money and whatnot. But by fifth grade, if you can't cross the street, that's because we as the adults and community members have not taught the skills that we are requiring for them to be safe. And pedestrians need to be safe in the street. You have kids that have been run over, buses that have been accused of going too fast. So I just want to partner with you guys as well as thank you guys to hope that these safety issues can be addressed in our community as well. Absolutely, thank you. Similar problem as our last name. Uh, my name is Thor Trevason. Uh, I live in Perry Hall. And um, uh, first of all, I'd like to say Baltimore County is a great place to live in. Um, it's shown by influx of people moving to the county over the, over the years. As you mentioned, um, over the last 30 years, there's been an influx of people. Um, but that comes with a responsibility and uh, the responsibility to fund. Uh, recreational facilities, schools, and infrastructure. Uh, trailers have become permanent fixtures at many schools, not only in the Northeast area where I live, but many other uh, schools. Uh, Perry Hall Middle School is severely overcrowded and has been for a long time. It is slated to be the largest school in the county with uh, almost uh, 2,100 students next fall, which is 126% uh, of capacity. Uh, it's slated to be larger than any high school in the county. Right. <clears throat> now, um, it will be mitigated with the new middle school that's, that's slated. Uh, that's a few years down the road. Um, there's still immense pressure on the uh, elementary school system 
in the Northeast area, even with the new uh, Honeywell Elementary School, we still are missing over a thousand seats for elementary school level. So we could add another elementary school and we would still have kids that are overcrowding our schools. Um, I would love to see the county create opportunities for uh, our rec councils to have training spaces. Uh, and, uh, furthermore, I'd love to see a sportsplex in the uh, Northeast area, um, 5th District, 6th District area, 4395. Uh, uh, I personally believe that it would attract um, sports uh, events to the area, uh, and you could um, use that for both rec programs and, and sports clubs. The only rec center, indoor rec center that I know of in the area is the Northeast Re uh, Regional Rec Center, which was built uh, 46 years ago, taken over by the county in 2009, and it's simply not adequate as it is shared by nine different councils ranging from Towson up to Kingsville. And there's, um, oh, it's almost, in, as father of two, it's almost impossible to get training time for, for, for my kids in sports there. Um, we've talked about impact fees here tonight. I've, I've heard several decisions talk about impact fees. I'm very pro in, impact fee. Um, <coughs> so one of your slides is you, you don't want to leave any money on the table. Uh, Baltimore County is the uh, only metropolitan county in the state of Maryland that does not have impact fees. And with that, uh, the county has left over $400 million on the table just for the past 10 years. So there's, there's lots of money on the table right there. And it doesn't affect current uh, people, or current residents in the county, it's only for uh, new development. Um, and it's great to hear that, that you're going to look hard into spending and uh, priorities. And uh, I don't envy you and your colleagues of, of the position that you're in of, of making sure that you spend the, the, the tax dollars as wisely as possible, but uh, I urge you to, to do that and look hard into it. Thank you. For you, you were an example of engagement. Uh, Nottingham Middle School, whatever we're going to call it, is going to proceed because of people like you. Thank you for your advocacy. We're going to need it as we move forward. Thank you. Out of all the politicians, probably in the media area, you are one that will respond on a daily basis. Um, I talked to you earlier about the Kingsville Drive and the, the water main down there. <coughs> you, uh, you did go, not, nobody really knew what was going on, so thanks for the update. But I'm just wondering on the, the water line, who job the road to get it from like Bel Air Road all the way across? <coughs> um, it's over by Barry now, Cedar Hill. I know it stops at Burke and Hillen. Um, I know it's a major project. I'm just wondering when it would be complete or if you have an update. Um, frankly, I thought the option to drive the truck down the road because it's, it's uh, and second of all, speed enforcement along Joppa Road. Um, I, I know I've questioned you about this before, but you sit up at the bus stop and cars drive down Joppa Road at 70 miles an hour. They should have an interstate sign up there instead of, you know, a 30 mile an hour zone. And I'm just wondering if there's any way we can get more speed enforcement, you know, protecting little kids that sit right along the job road at the bus stop this morning. And the gentleman earlier about the bus driver, yeah, that, that's every day. They run, uh, they just need to be more traffic enforcement in the high, uh, high traffic areas because it's just, uh, it, it's just, it, it's sad to watch it. I got a new driver in the family. He's afraid to go with John Brooke. He's afraid to be run over by somebody doing 75 mile an hour down there when it's what, a 30 mile an hour zone, I think, most of Joppa Road. So I'm just wondering if you have any update on the water project and pavement of Joppa Road or uh, speed enforcement. Thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. So the county completed a water project on Joppa Road. Uh, well, Joppa Road is the spine of the district. I, I drive that every day when I go to Towson. I live in Seven Ports. Um, so the project was completed so late that you know, major resurfacing did not occur. Uh, and obviously we're not going to be resurfacing until the spring comes. Uh, it illustrates a, a, a point that we not only have to make with Baltimore County, but also with BGE, uh, where sometimes BGE will come in once they lay their utility work and they'll just put this patch along. Uh, and they'll say that restoring a road to its 
previous condition? No, it's not. It makes the driving conditions worse for everyone, <coughs> and we need to require curb and road servicing wherever possible. With regard to speed enforcement, um, I already mentioned how the county executive is working with the council to uh, increase the set asides for traffic calming. Um, there's other things you can do. Uh, obviously, better police enforcement takes <coughs> place away from other responsibilities. Um, there's places you can have more <coughs> radio boards. Um, one of the ideas I like is putting these digital signs up that flash your speed as you go by. They don't ticket you, they flash your speed. And it's a simple reminder of the speed you're going. So there's a lot we can do. I think the county executive and I both agree we need a much more robust traffic calming policy that's more sensitive to neighborhoods. So thank you. Thank you. My name is Andrew Colton. I live in Taos Manor Village. Um, I'm going to go off script for a moment as far as the traffic calming question. I think as a designer, um, I encourage the county to consider looking at the way they develop streets and just scaling things for the way that the speed that they're supposed to be going rather than having a giant highway be a 30 mile an hour road, design the road to be a 30 mile an hour road, and that can help a lot of safety issues throughout the county. Uh, there's just an antiquated traffic. Uh, engineer way of thinking that right now it needs to be updated to current standards. But in the in the meantime, I'm actually going to say my family chose Towson to move from another state nine years ago, and unfortunately, we feel like a number of the reasons why we moved to Towson are no longer there. When we first moved, we lived in an apartment and we walked to Trader Joe's for many of these other things, and it's very much a wasteland unless I want to go to a restaurant or bar. At this point in time, many things are in the works. I uh, just want to encourage the county executive and um, others to be involved in the process of bringing in meaningful retail, because retail doesn't even exist right now in downtown Towson, um, and also other activities that are family friendly rather than just the continuation of proliferation of bars and things like that that wind up wind up sucking people from each other rather than actually encouraging the community, but also. But as mentioned already, the loss of trees, loss of other things that make the downtown area uh, more enjoyable. I want to encourage you to continue to be involved with the schools as you promised to be. Uh, we came here with a positive look on the Baltimore County Schools, and we had some frustrations and currents with the with transportation. Uh, we appreciate the hardworking bus drivers, but there are certainly issues that are going there. Ongoing challenges with working with the state and the mandates that have been going on with calendaring stuff. Uh, that's a huge concern for us because that's right now my kids are already getting home at almost 4.30 each day. It's making it very difficult for us to get involved in any sort of after school activities with our children. And if we have to add 10 minutes to our day towards the end of the day, that's just not even going to be possible for us unless something happens somewhere else in the schedule. So that's a significant concern, concern for us. Uh, obviously the superintendent church search is a uh, concern. Uh, getting back to spring break. Yeah, I know that's kind of a play against itself with that 10 minute trans 10, 10 minute thing, but a lot of those things are concerns. As a resident of Towson Manor Village, you've already heard the concerns about code enforcement. That's an ongoing, always issue. We, I don't even know if we have a street sign left in the community at this point in time because they keep getting broken or disappearing and having to be replaced over and over again. We want to save some um, money on ongoing infrastructure issues, figure out ways to keep those things from getting disappearing on an ongoing basis. It certainly would save a lot of money in that would have gone long term. Um, just code enforcement issues related to those kind of things would be day to day, having police on the street to be able to handle those things or whether it be off duty police officers, security guards, or whatever it might be throughout the community. Thank you. It's hard for me to believe the report that um, 
they authorized to send 60 guinea pigs at stage to a snake or a food as a way to solve the problem of adoption. Um, also having cats released on county property without proper food and shelter. Um, do you currently have a plan to address the issues at the services before too many other people end up leaving and end up being a critical issue of staffing? We are um, reviewing the information that's been provided to us and exploring um, several options at this point. We haven't made any decisions, but I'm aware of the issues and concerns that have been raised, and I, and I share them. We're working on uh, a response at this point. Because I know currently there are people already looking for the jobs, and if something's not coming soon, I think you're going to end up with a shortage of jobs. And the animals are going to be the ones that suffer. Thank you. That. Thank you for your respect. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joe Altoff, and I'm a 50-year resident of Lock Raven Heights, and we have a very small problem compared to everybody else, but the problem is rats. They are inundating our neighborhood. They've overrun us. Uh, people that have parking pads out back park their cars there, and the next morning they don't start because the rats have gotten in and eaten the corners. <coughs> and um, it's, I put out every poison you know, around my area, that Home Depot or that sells, it's ineffective. My next door neighbor has had an exterminator put in boxes. Rats don't go near them. Um, and it seems like Baltimore County is part of the problem. You'll come in and clean out the sewers. And when you clean out the sewers, the rat population explodes. You'll come in and spray the neighborhoods in the alleys. It forces them up top towards the houses, you know, closer to the houses. You spray, you know, the, um, say below our neighborhood or above our neighborhood or east or west, it just moves, you know, and it's, the problem is just uh, getting so bad that, you know, I think uh, we lost one neighbor because, you know, people was having too many car problems in the alley. So anything that you can do to organize us would be, uh, you know, we call code enforcement. You know, we identified a house in our neighborhood that had multiple rat holes. In fact, I watched a cat play whack a mole with them, you know, one evening, you know, right about sunset. And the county puts a notice on the door, comes back, I forget what the time period is, I think it's a couple weeks later, puts another notice on the door, and then they get another notice telling them, you know, that they have a court appearance, and then the whole process takes a summer, you know, to get something done. <coughs> Question. Yes. How, how successful do you think the twice a week trash collection is? I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue is uh, dog owners that don't clean up the feces. I think it's people that don't use trash can lids, um, people that don't use trash cans at all. Um, it's a group, you know, it's a community thing where you have people that have switched, and I've talked to many people into getting metal trash cans. That seems to be uh, solve part of the problem. I watched the trash man come up during the summer. He pulled a uh, lid off the trash can and the rat jumped out. You know, before he did, you know, before he did something, you know, with the can, he just pulled the lid off and the rat jumps out. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but, you know, I called the county a week ago and I said, is there someone that can come in and help me find where the burrows are, where I, you know, you know when I find them, you know, I'll stuff them with broken glass with steel wool, patch it with concrete. You know, one time during the summer, I found a rat hole, I put a hose in it. It took 20 minutes before the water came out in the alley. Was that extensive? Huh? Was that extensive? Yes. Yeah, and I think you've identified that a lot of times the food source is the issue, whether it's pet or not cleaning up or, or the trash. And so we need to find more comprehensive ways to be responsive on the code enforcement front on things like so find a way to have a process in place where we get homeowners with, you know, uh, trash company type thing lives. And, and, and just to sort of continue the conversation, I'll, I'll just tell you. But I think when the county comes by, they have to get into the yards too. Sure. You know, it's like just to do the alleys just forces them up closer to the homes. And you mean in terms of treatment? Hmm? Treatment in terms of treatments? Yes. Yeah. And so, um, I called an exterminator. He just told me I was wasting my money. And yet the camera 
you know, I have a security camera that goes off a dozen times a night, you know, with the rats running through right, you know, six feet from my door. We'll keep working with you. Thank you for your comments. Okay, thank you. Concerns of Perry Hall, Kingsville, Nottingham, White Marsh. I'm just going to speak on a few about education. First of all, in the last couple of years, we've had obviously, as you stated, increased in development. Um, as Councilman Mark said, that the schools are affected by two things: development and then new families moving in. The east side of Baltimore County was originally designated as a growth area. It hasn't been a growth area since 2010, and the master plan is now a conservation area. But fortunately, we haven't kept up with that. I speak with Councilman Marks on a regular basis, and he and I agree on, on certain things. Um, he's done a lot to reduce development, um, reduce zoning, do a lot of other things. Unfortunately, adjacent Council Matic districts have not. And the Perry Hall 5th District area is seeing a lot of the effects of adjacent districts overdeveloping, not planning, not reducing any type of zoning. Um, one of the things I think that we could do is, while the property is still available, and I know it's going to be a significant investment, and I know we don't necessarily have a lot of money right now, but while the property is still available, there's a large corridor down Route 43 that I think the county should investigate in purchasing for future educational facilities. Um, as you said, we've gone from 750,000 to 832,000 people in Baltimore County. I expect that to continue growing um, for various different reasons. We need to plan ahead. A little bit of money now is really gonna save us in the future. 
as land becomes more scarce, it becomes more expensive. There is no excessive amount of property on the far side of 43 that was not developed. Um, Asia world, NASCAR tracks, all those things were talked about. Then frack came along, that didn't, that didn't happen. That really is the only land left um, on the east side of Baltimore County. And I think Baltimore County would be wise to take a look right now and instead of allowing the continued residential development, that we look at some property and, and look at it for the future. Invest in it now, knowing that our schools are gonna become more, more crowded. Um, that also being said is the, the development on the, the far side, the east side of 40, um, the infrastructure has not kept up with those residential developments. So recreational, entertainment, everything. There's very little recreation area being developed in the fifth district. Therefore, it sends all the newer residents in, or I'm sorry, in the sixth district, sending all the residents into the fifth district where we're already overcrowded. We have little kids playing soccer games at 8 o'clock at night because there just is no other time. As far as, as, far as schools, um, I think Julie Hen would probably agree. We've had some significant bus safety issues. Um, I know that's been mentioned, bus driver here, but when you have kids sitting on bus floors to get back and forth to school, that needs to be addressed. So again, looking and expanding our bus and our transportation, just overall looking at that. One of the things that we've been asking for for years and I think is essential is uh, address <coughs> verification for school enrollment. Address verification for school enrollment. Make sure that the people that live in the areas are going to the right schools. I don't want to say that certain people can't go to certain schools, but you know, let, let's go with the residence verification in the areas first, and then when there are openings, we'll allow other people to come in. Um, impact, impact fees have been mentioned many times. I'm not going to dwell on that. Enough said on that one. And then this last part, um, I think is going to be somewhat controversial, but I'm going to throw it out at you anyway. Um, I think you should establish a commission uh, to look at the fiscal and economic impact of immigration in Baltimore County, um, particularly as it relates to education. Uh, since 2010, we've spent about $33 million um, Baltimore County money, which is about 51% of the budget, comes from the county, the rest comes from the federal state. We spent $33 million on children of unlawful residents. I guess that's a proper way to put that. Um, let's take a look, establish a commission. Don't make any changes now. Establish a commission to take a look at the fiscal and economic impact of um, unlawful residency in Baltimore County and see how it relates to um, signing a, a decree for a 287G enforcement. Thank you. Jack, Jack, thank you for your leadership as president of the Paranormal Crew Association in the same position I once held. Um, there are a lot of stakeholders who can help us with this school issue. Uh, the state legislature, the governor, uh, you know, one out of every three dollars comes from the state in terms of school construction. The county executive has been very eloquent in talking about the need to get some of our funding back before we fall the funding. Um, the county council plays a role, and I'm happy that we've downzoned a lot of the land so that the schools can up, but also your school board. Um, the fifth district representative is Julie Hen. She is here tonight. Kathy Causey is here tonight. I want to tell you one of the best things that happened in the last election was the election of the school board. And uh, the county executive was a champion for this one. He was a member of the House of Delegates. And you are seeing the results right now. You are seeing a school board that is more fiscally prudent and that is looking at things like residency, discipline, laptop computers. And I think we're going to be a real part of it. So you brought up a lot of issues. And as someone else said, I think the stars are all aligning. We have the right place to make a difference. One of the key things, again, like I said, I, I, it is controversial, but uh, let's, let's establish a commission to look at 287G enforcement, some kind of agreement. Um, if that federal money is out there, I'm not saying take those 4,000 undocumented citizens. I'm not saying take them out of Baltimore County schools. But let's go after some federal funding to help support that $33 million that we're spending on these individuals instead of it coming out of Baltimore County's pockets. Thank you.
was mentioned, that was a plan that was supposed to come out of debt. Millions of dollars wasted in a 2014 plan when there's no plan to come of it. Um, the recent high school assessment that was done, um, I was part of the focus groups at the beginning, um, went to all the meetings, it's over a year in development, and at the most recent meeting when the results were presented, the plan is that there really isn't a plan. Um, so again, it's not the quantity of funds that we're asking for, it's also the quality and how they're spent. Um, there are many additions, renovations, new schools that were funded that the building was overcrowded. So again, the problem persists. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask of you is um, something that I've taken a um, personal um, plea. I know I spoke with um, David Marks earlier this school year. A couple of years ago, the state legislature um, passed a law that decreased the required number of fire bills that the schools had to do. Um, down to five. Um, our county school system does about 13. Um, it's a lot of time that is spent with these drills. I went to the school um, office of safety um, right after the legislation was passed to see what the school system was going to do. Um, they said it was up to the county. The county fire marshal told me, no, um, it's okay. You, you can move forward with removing that requirement, giving that time back to the classroom, to the teachers, to the school administrators, which is really important since we're adding the Alice um, training, we still have the, um, the other drills that the schools are required to do. So if we can give any time back to the school, it's really important. So I ask that you please, it's free, um, it's a win-win for everyone, you can please work with the school system to um, make sure that they know and that they implement this reduced number of Thank you. Yeah, we can absolutely make sure we can protect our, uh, our fire chief and school system to, to investigate that. So, appreciate that. Yes. Hi, I'm GT Keplinger. I live in Thompson States. Hi, David. Um, and I've been the president of two different community associations. And part of the reason I left Berkeley Square, where I was the president seemingly forever, um, was because of the code enforcement issues. And I live in Towson Estates, and it, for all intents and purposes, it's like another planet in terms of the, we don't have any of the trouble that Berkeley Square had. I don't know if anybody else has had VGE come in to do their gas lines. Anybody had that? It's been an absolute disaster. Our streets hadn't been paved since sometime in the early 1980s in Towson Estates. Um, they weren't great to begin with, but they're exponentially worse now in between VGE, Riggs Distler, Mahoney, there's been no accountability from anyone. Everybody else is like, well, that's their problem, that's their problem. Here we are with abysmal streets that are getting worse. All the, the patches that they've done, and I understand that you've been working on curb to curb replacement, which would be fantastic, but it's just, we've been asking to see who from the county has, has checked off on the work because we've been led to believe that someone from the county has approved the work, but I can't believe that in good conscience anybody could approve the work. And we're all taxpayers, and the streets are just a, in abysmal condition. And if possible, we'd like to try to arrange for someone to come look at the streets and say, this is totally unacceptable. We need to get on the list to have the, the streets resurfaced in the neighborhood. Yeah, we'll, we'll partner with the council's office to make sure that happens. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nancy Boyd, and I live in the Castle on the Castle Circle. And I have been trying for years to get that parking area in front of the houses repaid. All I'm getting is people coming through from roads, patching the area, and that's just not, uh, act, that's not acceptable at all. And what's happening in the summertime, we get all of this green drainage behind the cars. Uh, to me, it's a safety, it's a hazard, I think it's a health hazard. And I would just love to have the roads repaved. I want to know where I'm on the list, they won't tell me where I'm on the list to have it repaved. And I've been in that community for over 30 years, and I'm still waiting to have the uh, parking areas be paved. So, so I will tell you that um, I've heard that frustration a lot, as, as I know Council Mars has, and we are actually one of the one of the places we actually do great in Baltimore County are our roadways. So we're in active conversations about finding ways to try to get that information public. So that just like we're, we're pushing for a school facility plan, we can sort of prioritize and rank um, our, our repayment needs and, and just sort of put that out there and be able to start quantifying when projects can actually get done so you have a better sense of where we are. Yes, I wanted to 
the Union Council and the County Exec. Thanks for coming out. Um, Nate, for those of you that don't know me, Nate Evans, I um, serve on the Baltimore County Investment Industry Advisory Committee. Uh, I've also made biking, walking, planning, and then, um, design as part of my career. Not only because I love it, and it's a great way to get around, but it, it also makes a great place to live. And we live in uh, Perry Hall, uh, the rest of my life. And it's, um, it's a great place to live, but it's definitely a hard place to walk and bike, as most of the county is. And that's just because of the county policies have been on the books for you know, 50, 60 years. So I know both of you guys are already on board with uh, pushing forward a lot more walking, biking, um, and trail projects. Uh, I just want to continue you guys to uh, encourage that, to, to move it on forward. And also to kind of help streamline and modernize a lot of our um, zoning and policy practices in the county. Uh, what we've seen, I've seen as a county advocate um, for years is a lot of the plans are on the books and just ignoring them. Whether it's a trail project that just doesn't get funded or a community plan that calls for a more walkable, uh, business friendly downtown for it all, instead we go ahead and make 100 more parking spaces. And that's just the wrong way to do it. And if we're going to try and compete with counties like Howard and Montgomery and Prince George's that are making it easier for people to get around walking, biking, and transit, then we need to do the same thing here, or else we're going to lose residents, especially as they age, because we really shouldn't be making more parking spaces for senior citizen centers. Those people need to have options to get around without having to drive. And that's what's going to keep people in the county instead of moving elsewhere. Thanks for your time. Hey, uh, thanks for all your good work on all this. One of the things we did in downtown Towson was we actually relaxed the parking requirements in downtown Towson. And this was an area where environmentalists and developers agreed. You know, we tend to build these projects, uh, the, you know, shopping centers and such, to 1950s or Black Friday standards. We just don't need all the parking. I'm the one who believes the private sector will determine how much parking the development needs. So that's one area of evidence we have. You know, we have relaxed the parking requirements, we need all those requirements, and maybe it's something we can look at doing around the future. But even there, the housing gave way. That just became a sea of parking after all those rooms were knocked down. So there's more we can do. Thanks. Nice. And last but not least. Thank you. Uh, appreciate your having this and giving us all the opportunity to uh, express our, our concerns to you. Uh, we heard a lot about the need for impact fees from, from uh, citizens here in the audience. A uh, suggestion from my friend here, Jen Bolster, that if we want good schools, if we want paved roads, we have to pay for them. So I'm willing to have my taxes raised. Um, and I think there are others who are willing to have that too, if we also have developers who are paying their impact fees. So we've got a lot of needs, but we, we also need to come up with the revenue. So we're looking to you to provide that leadership, both of you, all of you, to provide the leadership to find funding. Uh, the other thing that, that's kind of an, an issue is, so I'm an advocate for Towson High School, which is one of the schools that needs funding. Towson High School is represented, the, the district that the Towson High families you know, live in is represented by four council districts, two, three, five, and six. It's represented, so that issue about Lock Hill and where you go and, you know, the council districts, the legislative districts, the school districts, there's a misalignment and we're, it's a problem in terms of advocacy. We have so many schools that are overcrowded and we're divided as to where we can advocate for to in terms of you know elected officials. So when it's time to do the um, legislative redistricting and the census and look at districts again, Try to align those council districts, the legislative districts, the school districts, so that they're we're not so divided, so that we have better better advocacy. Jobs. Thank you, thank you, Phoebe. Um, I'm actually one of those who took an unpopular position in advocating for increasing the size of the council from seven yeah. to nine. It requires a charter change, which um, first you have to go to the council to get there, and we didn't have support with the council for that. Um, in lieu of that, um, you know, uh, the council districts should be compact. They should be logical and they should respect the community values. The good thing about Baltimore County is that redistricting plan, which will come about for the 2022 election, 
will have to be bipartisan. It requires five votes of the council. There are four Democrats, three Republicans. It will have to be bipartisan, so you won't have the gerrymandering you see at the federal maps. Uh, but I promise you, you know, um, that Towson uh, should have should have logical representation, so should Perry Hall, so should a lot of other communities. And uh, you know, those maps will be here in, like I said, about two years. Thank you. <coughs> Um, for those of you who survived and lasted the whole time, thank you for, for sticking in. Um, thank you for your advocacy. Um, as I'm fond of saying, these are meant to be the beginnings of conversations and not the end. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Councilman's Office and I will remain engaged with all of you individually on your issues as well as um, sort of the ones that followed up as larger community concerns. Um, so, I want to thank Councilman Marks again. Um, for partnering and look forward, we look forward to working